Jackson. And I'm the Director of Business Operations for the Office of Alumni Affairs at Auburn University. And for the next 30 minutes, your host of 18 minutes and 56 seconds, the Auburn Alumni Association Speaker Series. To see all of our shows, you can go to aub.ie forward slash 1856 series. We want to keep this fast moving. So all our guests will talk or present, do whatever they do for no more than 18 minutes and 56 seconds. We also want to hear from you. So ask questions and interact by leaving comments on our Facebook page. We'll do our best to answer them in the half hour that we have together. Today, we have two special guests, Auburn University President Jay Goose and Vice President of the Office of Alumni Affairs, as well as Executive Director <coughs> of the Auburn Alumni Association, Gretchen Van Valkenburg. In this segment, Gretchen will serve as co-host while interviewing Dr. Goosh. They will be discussing higher education in a post-pandemic world and how to lead in times of great change. Gretchen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Eddie, and War Eagle, everybody. Um, I am thrilled to be able to join you today. And um, uh, before I begin, I just wanted to personally thank Dr. Goosh and the senior leadership at Auburn University. Uh, over this past year, it's just been uh, such, such an amazing uh, group of individuals who have kept our university afloat, if you will, open and, and really fulfilling our mission. And really at the, the cornerstone of all of that is the effort to keep everybody safe. So thank you for uh, being uh, your guiding hand um, over the last year. And uh, we really appreciate your leadership. Um, recently, you, you shared with a few of us some interesting statistics about higher education. And I think our viewers today would really enjoy hearing about those uh, to get our conversation started. So there you are. Thank you, Gretchen and War Eagle to everybody. I'm delighted to be with you. Uh, we did spend a lot of time last year in meetings. I, I went back through my calendar and uh, I met with Gretchen and the full cabinet 91 times uh, last year as we tried to plan and work through this uh, pandemic. One of the one of the things that I always like to share is that uh, most people are not aware of the size of the higher ed enterprise in this country. Uh, there are about 5,200 public and private universities, colleges and universities, and there are about 7,000 for-profit colleges and universities. So our enterprise is about 12,000 plus uh, entities and when you think about the pandemic, think about post-pandemic in particular, each of those institutions, each of those universities, they have their own unique culture, their own history, their own values, their own traditions. And they all respond to the pandemic in different ways. And they certainly will come out of the pandemic in different ways. And we spent a lot of time talking about that uh, probably the worst information you can read is when people say higher ed is doing this because there are 12,000 different responses in the way higher ed is actually doing this or doing that. So that's always uh, something that we try to encourage people to think about uh, when they think about higher ed. It's really important to think about Auburn if that's where your interests are. The uh, a lot of the discussion that uh, when you think about getting through this pandemic has to do with the way in which uh, content is delivered in the instructional portion of our mission. And as much as uh, uh, we sometimes hate to admit it, uh, the idea of remote delivery of instruction is not new. Uh, if you go back into the 1800s, correspondence courses were widely used by universities. Uh, the typical response or typical way it worked is the university mailed out a syllabus, they mailed out textbooks and material, the students studied on their own, and then the exam were mailed to the local libraries in which the student would go and actually take the exam while the librarian watched them and they'd mail the exam back to their institution. This was common in the United States up into the 1970s, 1980s in our country. When I uh, finished at Auburn and uh, was uh, an ROTC student, my military courses in the 1970s were correspondence courses, in which you'd go through and do that. So 
Most people thought didn't think much about that. And then uh, if you go back almost 100 years ago, a number of urban universities offered their content on radio in which the same process, you listen to the lectures, you then went to the local library, you took your exams. And then in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, educational television became the mode in which folks would watch the TV show and similarly go and take their exams uh, uh, and submit those. And so the idea of remote education is really not new. In 2010, our national organization of state universities and land grant colleges recommended to the universities that about uh, as much as 25% of your courses should be offered in the electronic or the uh, remote format. And their logic was that when you leave universities and go to work in uh, industry, business, government, whatever, that most of your professional training in the future will be done through remote learning. It won't be the old model of we're going to send all of our staff to some location and pay the airline tickets for, <clears throat> for them to stay three or four days or a week and receive training. So there was an encouragement to do that. And the number that I always remember that was shocking in 2010, more individuals in the United States were taking their coursework remotely than were at all of the state universities and land grant colleges in this country. So to some extent, the idea of remote learning has been with us for a long time. And we, uh, we've learned a lot during this period. Auburn pivoted in a matter of days from uh, completely live instruction. I think uh, the provost shared with us that about 75% of our faculty had never taught a course remotely. And suddenly within days, we were all going to the remote format. Uh, we've learned a lot during that process. Uh, I taught a course in the fall and I had taught it for a number of years and it's always been live instruction. And I went to the format of what they call a blended course. And that was where I, one lecture was live, the next one would be remote, live remote throughout the semester. And I was amazed. I think the students may have liked the remote better than the live. And part of it was because you could bring in people from literally all over the country to talk very specifically about a topic in which I would have never been able to get them to fly to, all, fly to Atlanta, drive to Auburn. It would have taken two or three days for them to be able to do that. So we were able to get some very impressive external speakers to, for our class. So we've learned a lot during the process and uh, well, excited to be where we are uh, in that process. As we think about sort of the future as the pandemic eases, uh, there's a movement in which the core curriculum, general education, that's that block of courses that really every student at every university will take. It's that couple of English courses, it's the history course, it's a couple of math courses, uh, history course or so. And so <clears throat> there's been a, an effort nationally to try to say, how do we deliver those courses in a remote format such that they're free and available to all students nationwide in which then schools like Auburn would probably not relies much on ACTs or SAT nationalized exams, but basically admission would be around, have you completed the, the core courses that were available? It's a, a mechanism that would certainly reduce costs for families. And it's a mechanism in which you would get some, uh, some content that was really ubiquitous across the fields of higher education. So we're seeing some of that Another real issue that uh, our change that we're seeing is enrollment numbers are making uh, uh, a real uh, difference at a lot of those 12,000 institutions. We see that uh, community colleges enrollment has dropped. We see that some of the regional universities enrollment has dropped. As an example, uh, in Alabama, 
for the fall of 2020, only two schools in this state had an increase in enrollment, Auburn University and Auburn at Montgomery. All other schools had declining enrollment. Out there about the time we come out of the pandemic is the, the mid 2020s in which the birth rate during the last economic recession dropped. And so there are fewer kids that are actually in high schools or in elementary schools today that will be our potential students about 2024, 2025. And so uh, that's gonna be uh, an issue or a concern that universities have to grapple with. Uh, another uh, thing that I think is positive that will come out of it is really the mixed modalities of instruction. We are still gonna see live courses, certainly at Auburn, uh, even during this pandemic for this term, about 75% of all the courses will be taught live, about 25% in either a blended or a hyplex type uh, format. So we'll see some of those changes. Prior to the pandemic, uh, the closure rate on universities was about one a week. So wow. about 50 a year went out of business. Uh, many experts in this field view that there will be three or 400 universities that will not survive the pandemic. So that will make some, certainly some changes. But let me just stop there and see what's on your minds. Be happy to try to respond to any questions that you may have. So um, Dr. Goose, first of all, thank you for all of that update. One of the things I, I'm curious about just administratively, um, the speed with which, uh, you know, we pivoted as a university and went remote, both operationally and on the academic side. I personally hope that we'll be able to adopt some of that, um, I don't know, you know, speed in terms of change, uh, being change agents. What are your thoughts on that? And is that, is that gonna happen? Or are we gonna try to snap back to our old normal? Um, what are those lessons learned from your vantage point? Well, I think we learned that we could be far more flexible than we thought we could be. I've jokingly said that if we had made a, a commitment on March 1st that in September or August when we started the fall semester that we would be 80% uh, remote delivery, I would have had to uh, hire a consulting company and paid them uh, a fortune and we still would not have complied. And so it, it's really a testament to the faculty's ability to move rather quickly for the entire team at Auburn to realize the world's different. We got to do things differently. Uh, we made more decisions uh, last year than we probably made in the 10 years previously. You had to make them, you had to be agile, you had to be flexible, you had to do it. We tried to do it in concert with our internal governance groups. So uh, when I mentioned the 91 meetings that we have with Gretchen, <laughs> Also at those meetings were the president of the student body, the president of the faculty senate, and the president of our two employee groups. And so they were involved in the discussion uh, to, to tell us sometimes that, hey, we've made mistakes. We've not done everything perfectly. And uh, when we make mistakes, which we did, we tried to correct them as soon as we could. But uh, there's been a real spirit within this community for us to be able to navigate it. And I would have to say that unlike, again, if you read the, the generic literature on higher education, we have not abolished any programs. We have not uh, 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 reduced the working force. We haven't furloughed people. We haven't reduced salaries or any of those things. We've tried to just keep moving ahead with our basic mission of teaching and research and service. And uh, I'd have to, uh, I'd have to brag on Auburn people. Uh, we exceeded our goal in private fundraising this year with all of the uncertainties uh, and uh, none of us expected that. Uh, some universities literally closed their doors, euthanized their animals and went home. And we were fortunate we didn't have to do that. And the result was I think our research numbers were up 65, $70 million in that range. And uh, that was just a phenomenal testament of people trying to work through the uncertainties of this pandemic. So I'm hopeful that that same spirit 
will carry forward in terms of being a little more flexible, a little bit more willing to try new things, uh, willing to fail at times and correct it as soon as we realize we fail. Well, this show is a perfect example of our opportunity to do things differently. I mean, our traditional way of engaging alumni has been in person and, and we had about two weeks and went, oh my goodness, we've got to figure out how we're going to do this. And so <laughs> our team just really um, came up with this show and it's been a tremendous asset. And I think it'll be a part of our menu of programs as we move forward. We'll have some sort of a hybrid approach. Yeah. And, and speaking of that, what do you think um, some of the things will, that will be retained in terms of, you know, what we have, we have operated in on the academic side, what will we, we retain and what, um, what won't we retain, do you think? And I know you don't have a crystal ball, but. Well, I think, uh, as I say, the, every one of these schools are different. And I think Auburn people <clears throat> have always valued the out-of-class experience that students have. I don't want to say equal to the end-of-class experience, but it's certainly a, a key part of the Auburn experience. And so we know we have to retain that. Uh, in spite of all kind of new methods and new ways to offer uh, educational opportunities, we still have to recognize that Auburn, unlike a lot of universities, we still service an awful lot of 18 to 24 year old students. And when you look nationally, the 18 to 24 uh, year old student is the minority now that is attending college. The non-traditional numbers are actually over 50% of the students. And so our niche in the marketplace is still going to be that 18 to 24 year old. And we're going to value the, both the in-class real experience and the out-of-class experience. When you see us compared to others in the SEC, um, we, we think Auburn is awfully special and we've rebounded pretty well. I, I was on a call with some of my colleagues across the SEC um, and we've done remarkably well as an alumni association, but what is it that's special about Auburn in their preparation and ability to respond to this pandemic? Well, we get good kids. Uh, <clears throat> the students that come are, are very, very good. And uh, they're bright and they're capable and they're adaptable. And so, in fact, uh, one of the traditions I always like to share that is alive and well at Auburn is that parents don't necessarily, I'm sorry, students don't necessarily tell their parents everything that's going on. And I used an example. I got a letter from a mother that had gone to school at Auburn, so she's an alumni. And she loved it. And she pointed out how, how she remembers those four years as the greatest years of her life. And that uh, her daughter is here on campus and she's only doing remote delivery courses and uh, it's just terrible and she's upset about it. And so provost and I, we called in the, the student and we said, why did you sign up for just these remote classes because you had a choice on some face-to-face -face classes. And the student said, I'm not getting up at eight o'clock in the morning to <laughs> take that live class. And we said, can we tell your mother? And she said, absolutely not. And so we're under federal rules that we can't sometimes share exactly what's going on. And now, I know those of you that are listening, you always told your parents the truth about everything. <laughs> but uh, I suspect that some didn't, and that tradition is live and well. No doubt about that. That's funny. Well, we, we often get questions, too, through our office, which then, you know, um, I've heard some similar stories for sure. So, so what um, this spring, we've had a lot of uh, already out of the gate, we've had some changes, um, you know, uh, with a new coach. So we're excited to, to hear about that and uh, looking forward to working with him. Yeah, it seems to be a, a really nice person. Uh, we've uh, we had a chance to obviously interview him and talk to him before uh, the offer was made for him. But uh, 
excited to, to have him. And it seems as if he's put together a, a very formidable group of assistant coaches and uh, been busy on the recruiting trail, I know, uh, because we were behind in that area. So hopefully we'll make some gains in that, in that area. And uh, recruiting is uh, obviously critical. Uh, you know, the old joke, it's, uh, it's not about the X's and O's, it's about the Jimmy's and Joe's that you have on the, on the team. And so uh, that's, uh, that's certainly their, their focus right now. That and really the health and safety of our, of our kids. Uh, uh, on a negative side, uh, there's been far more increases in mental health related uh, concerns by students and by parents and certainly by student athletes. Uh, the conference, as you know, was to some extent criticized for trying to move forward with a, uh, a football season in the fall with uh, the pandemic raging. And uh, it's, it's, and I understand the concerns with that. Uh, but when you talk actually to the players and to the student athletes, we forget sometimes uh, their passion uh, about their sport and about the experience they're having. And for an older person like me to be quarantined for 14 days, I know oh, that's pretty good. But for <laughs> young, 14 <laughs> days is a lifetime. And sure. so, yeah, uh, we had heard some of those stories about feeling isolated if they were in quarantine. And, um, you know, our, our office tried to reach out, and I know you did too. And, yeah. and to, just kind of give them some extra encouragement last last semester. So absolutely. Um, well, we're looking forward to next fall and certainly a day this year, depending on how that uh, is structured. But uh, we're excited about the new staff. Absolutely. The other great news that we received recently was the appointment of General Austin to the new cabinet. So we're awfully proud of him. We really are. Uh, that was uh, an exciting uh, appointment in our in our case. I think most of our folks realized that General Austin went to West Point as an undergraduate, and when he was stationed at Columbus at Fort Benning, he and his wife both came over and got master's degrees in the College of Education. I was able to find some of the faculty that were actually here when. Uh, the General Austin and Charlene, his wife, went through uh, their degrees. And so I asked them, I said, do you remember? And they said, yes, Charlene was a great student. So uh, <laughs> they didn't come to General Austin being a great student, but Charlene was. Oh, well, they are, they are certainly an asset and wonderful ambassadors to Auburn University. And we've enjoyed working with them and um, having having General Austin really as our liaison to the Board of Trustees was wonderful because every time he spoke, you know, that voice, everybody, you know, sat back and listened and, and we uh, certainly had a lot of fun working with him together. A lot of respect for him. He's, uh, he's a special, special individual and certainly hopeful that uh, I'm sure he will continue to show the leadership that he's shown throughout his long military career and his involvement certainly with Auburn. Absolutely. Well, we're very, very fortunate at Auburn, I think, to have great leaders in our board of trustees and um, foundation board, our alumni association board, research park board, all of the boards who really serve Tigers Unlimited. Um, we're just in a great position to uh, have that talent pool to draw from. So very, very fortunate. Eddie, are you getting any questions yet from our, our viewers? Plenty. Um, I, you know, I want to thank both you and Dr. Goosh for the relevance that you bring into this show. We have a chorus of War Eagle shout outs. And thank you <laughs> to, to both of you. And there are a couple of uh, questions. I'll start with some comments first. Um, the, there's several individuals. Dwight Satterfield asks if uh, there's any plans to increase the number of students admitted into high demand fields of nursing and medical sciences. So that's that's one of those questions that I can lead to you, Dr. Goosh. The, uh, the Board of Trustees has a, uh, two policies and one piece of guidance relative to uh, our student uh, enrollment. Number one is we're not to exceed 30,000 students at Auburn, total number. And I have to tell you this fall, 
we did the best we could, but it was 30,725 or so. So we overshot a little bit. So that's one factor. The next factor is that 60% uh, of the students that we admit must come from Alabama, 40% can be from out of state. So we're very close on, on that metric. And the third metric is we don't want to see the academic quality of the institution in any way diminished. And uh, I just went off your screen. <laughs> That's all right. Can you see me? Huh? No? Try it again. There, there you are. Go. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, the other one is when I came to Auburn, we were, our graduation rate was 60% of our kids graduated. And that was 2007. And our number today is 80%. And our board and our folks are very proud of that. And they don't want to see us increase to the point that we lose the uniqueness of the campus and that uh, we, uh, we end up uh, reducing the graduation rates. And part of that has to do with the student debt issue. If you, uh, the, the, the issue that kids have, in fact, the, the greatest amount of debt is either in professional students or in those students that go one or two semesters and drop out and really don't get the value out of the college degree that, uh, that would allow you to deal with debt issues. So those are the, the two, but uh, we have increased nursing. We have increased uh, the numbers in pharmacy, uh, almost a doubling in nursing in the last four or five years. And they do have new facilities and uh, we'll certainly push because some of us are getting to that age that we want to make sure there's plenty of those health care providers out there to take care of us. That's right. Um, Larry Hughes says he is proud of the efforts that AU has made during these difficult times. So there's a lot of comments out there about that specific and how, how well Auburn has been able to navigate through this. Lori Thompson says uh, to continue working in person learning. The lab-based sciences need to be in person is her suggestion. She just wants to see more of that happening. And Auburn clubs are not able to do in-person events and are worried about their local students being assisted. So there's, there's a, a desire to really help those students throughout. Ab um, absolutely. And, and I, I want to make sure people understand that uh, in nursing and pharmacy and veterinary medicine, many of their licensure requirements require face-to-face -face in person. Uh, we've jokingly said we have a large aviation program. I think about 600 students are in our flight programs at Auburn. And I don't care how good the simulator is, Delta Airlines won't hire you if you haven't flown the plane a little bit. So uh, we know that in person live instruction is our ultimate goal. And hopefully uh, in certain areas, you can use some of the remote learning to supplement, to augment it. I was thinking the other day, we may never have to have a day of classes called off because of weather. So now we have the ability to immediately pivot to a remote delivery form. So there's some options that uh, can grow out of this that would be better for us. There's a question that came through with regards to the pandemic, and uh, this one is, is directed to, uh, to both of you, uh, Gretchen as well. Kelly Lee Lucas asks, because of pandemics, how are scholarship fundraising, how is it going? Has it affected the, the fundraising? From uh, the perspective that we have is that uh, the private giving has actually exceeded our goals uh, that we had set, so that's very positive. Some of the federal CARES Act money that was su supplied to us what is available directly to students. And so we're seeing some increases in that. The uh, total amount of scholarship money, both merit-based and need-based and leadership-based. So we have three different pools of money have all increased in the past year. And I would, I would just add to that um, one of the, a couple of ways, you know, of course, we haven't had the in-person club events, which has always generated a lot of both annual scholarship funds and endowed funds, but um, the license plate program that uh, 
you know, we have a new design this last year was launched a year ago. Actually, the revenue from that is up about 2%. So that money is, is scholarship, um, goes into the scholarship fund. So thankfully, we've, we've fared very well, despite not being able to do the traditional events. So. But well, that doesn't mean that we aren't still looking for those scholarship of dollars. Course, so, of course, of course. So please be sure to look at us. <laughs> That being said, uh, Gretchen, there is a lot being said about uh, those that are grateful for the way that you've been able to support and the team has been able to support the Auburn clubs and what they're able to accomplish uh, through this time. So there's a lot of gratitude for that. We have just a couple of minutes left and uh, I wanted to leave those couple of minutes to either one of you to share um, anything that you want to share with regards to what the uh, post uh, pandemic will look like as far as the excitement behind what Auburn is able to do and who we are as a university. I, I would just make a simple comment that uh, the purpose of Auburn University is to help other people achieve their hopes and dreams. And so when I think about Auburn, whether it's that incoming freshman student or whether it's the graduate student or whether it's our own people, we want to do everything we can do to try to help, regardless of the external circumstances, to help that person achieve whatever it is they want to try to do in their life. And, and I think Auburn does it exceptionally well. And, um, and of course, our role is to have that lifelong relationship and when they become alumni and, and provide some engagement opportunities. So, Thank you so much, Dr. Gouge, for your leadership and for taking time out today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. War Eagle. War Eagle. War Eagle. The association is honored to have your leadership at the helm, helping Auburn University navigate through these challenging times. And we're better because of your hard work, both of you, your passion and dedication to our success. Our next episode will be joined, will be joined by Dr. Heidi Wright. Please visit aub.ie forward slash 1856 series for dates and times. Until then, stay safe and war eagle.